This podcast is a member of the Voices of Wrestling podcasting network. Visit VoicesOfWrestling.com to hear the rest of our great podcasts, as well as show reviews, columns, opinions, and updates across the world of wrestling. This is Everything Elite, the world's best podcast devoted exclusively to all elite wrestling and the elite extended universe. I'm Aaron, and I'm joined, as always, by my good friend, Nate, a.k.a. Epitasis. What's up, Nate? What's up? It's me. There I am. I'm on the show, the podcast, talk about AEW, uh, and exclusively that, that and that alone. Never talk about anything else. It's right there in the intro. So you get what you pay for, which is exclusively AEW chat. What's up with you, Aaron? Well, I'm not, I am getting ready to do exclusively AEW chat because I will reveal on this episode why Jungle Boy is booked like shit. Not really booked like shit, booked totally normally and uh, deserved to get beaten in about three seconds on tonight's show. So I'll talk about that later in the show. That's your tease. Okay. That's your tease. Mike, you're also here. Uh, I expect yeah. that you will support me in this endeavor. I, I, as always, I support my friends and co-hosts in their endeavors, and I will be supporting you. I, it, it, I'd i be getting the assist. We're going to set you up for this. You're our AD carry here. Uh, hey, y'all. It's your best friend. It's your best friend. Yes, I am your best friend. It, it's, your old, <laughs> it's your old pal, Aaron Mike Spears. What? Uh, What's happening? <laughs> I, I mean, it, it, it's 1021 at night. I've been up since before six. So, yeah, you know, we're, we're, we're getting wild on a Wednesday, but uh, everything's go, going pretty well here. I, earlier, before we started going, I was commenting on Aaron saw me early and did not, earlier did not comment on my new fit. And I was very sad and admirably aggrieved. But now, you know, we, we have an episode of dynamite talk about i apologize nate for talking about something that was not aew for a brief moment i will do better i hey, apologize don't, I don't apologize to me I apologize to the listeners who come here exclusively for aw chat i mean it is everything aew it's the twitter handle <laughs> wow thanks mike that is the twitter handle at everything <laughs> aew it is not the name of the show however no no no, no not at it. all it was good. yeah I, I i know how to do voice to audio i could talk good he, he does talk good, folks. Um, <laughs> yes, Nate? <laughs> you know, that famous thing you do, voice to audio. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I'm glad that you honed in on the genuine slip-up versus me trying to save it in the end there. You know? <laughs> I, the, 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 that was a joke for y'all, and then a joke for me. You know, everyone got to have a good time. I Just to follow up on last week, I've, I've come up on my least favorite album from the rolling stone top 500 list so oh boy. far oh boy are you ready who's, who's he gonna piss off this week he's uh i don't know such a such a firebrand with these hot takes i know pj harvey rid of me oh uh, yeah I, just absolute dog shit album wouldn't even sample it yeah I, that's right doesn't surprise me that you're against i'm not i have no opinion whatsoever on pj harvey but it makes sense it track i knew the name and i was like okay pj harvey and like I said, I try to go into these things with an open mind, and I was like, "This, this open-mindedly, this fucking sucks. It's just bad." What, what's the genre even? Uh, I think like college rock is a uh, okay. Is what I would call it. Uh, yeah, I don't know. It's just like stunned me that this made this list. They're literally most of the stuff that I don't like. Usually, a song will be on there that I'm like, "Oh, this song is kind of sick." You know, like I, I get this. No, I just was counting down the minutes till this album was over. <laughs> we'll see if there's any PJ Harvey defenders. They gotta exist. This was this was Rolling Stone, correct? What is what was the year in which this was published or divined? Uh let's see. It was they had to redo it because they forgot to put black people on the list the first time. Hmm. <laughs> I mean so, so they had to try again. <laughs> and uh they did a better job. Uh, this time around, I suppose they must have actually included people who maybe have ever listened to uh, music created by black people. Uh, 2012 is the newest edition. Okay. 
I, I was about to, it, it's something that like with like these lists, that's why I was like, yeah, of course they, they did because they're incredibly just, you know, they did like, you it's look just white at, dudes are mostly yeah, white dudes. It was kind of yeah. I was going to say something about like ivory towers. I'm going to try and be eloquent after I said voice <laughs> audio, you know, I was trying to save me, i save myself a little bit, but I mean, it, 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 it's something where like you look at that, you look at like the rock and roll hall of fame as well. Like, I have a major axe to grind against Canton, Ohio, to begin with, so... I, oh, I don't look at either of those things. It actually, As I continue to read the Wikipedia, apparently there was actually a revision in September of 2020. So this is a pretty fresh list. Hmm, You're about to cool. go back to the start, unless you got the 2020 revision, Aaron. I mean... I, I did, need... because I, I started this in January of 2021. Okay, so so, so you're good. You, you, I got you're the good newest list, regard. baby. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm looking at the 2020 Rock and Roll Hall of Fame inductees, and I feel like that this is for once, like they're actually like inducting people of color for once, which is kind of. I, I care about zero Halls of Fame. I feel like Halls of Fame are pretty stupid, just in general. Like, oh, I love if, a good if, Hall of Fame. If you're if you're famous, then you don't really need to be added to a list. It's like, hey, you've crossed this arbitrary threshold of fame, so. Congratulations. It's very stupid to me. Um, at least if you're going to do it, call it a hell of merit because that's what it is. They're not judging things based on fame. They have, you know, look at their stats, their RBI percentage or whatever the fuck. Uh, and that's what they make these decisions on. So first of all, call it correctly. <laughs> Second hey. of all, don't do it. Uh, Nate, I, I want you, I'm going to present a bunch of baseball stats to you. And half of them will be real and half of them will be fake just because you, 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 you tilted me a little bit with saying Pakoda. RBI percentage. Pakoda, <laughs> that's, a, that's not a statistic. That's a rubric. That's that, that, a, that, that's that's a, a, yeah, same thing. Sierra. Um, OBP. Um, okay, that's a statistic. Billy Barnes ratio. <laughs> that's not. <laughs> that's, that's the no. fucking that's Brad the Pitt guy. guy, man. <laughs> oh, I thought that was the Brad Pitt guy. What's no, that's uh, Billy Blank, Bean. Billy Bean. D Billy yeah. Bean, yeah. Is, is Bucky Barnes, that might be the Winter Soldier or something. Yeah, that, that's Barnes, Winter Soldier. Barnes is somebody. Keep on trying. Keep on trying. You're getting there. Um, I, You're getting I there. Was like, I was like a hardcore baseball Hall of Fame guy, and it that is what broke me from being against Hall of Fame. So I'm just like, okay, I'm done with this. I mean, it's... Wh which part? The Bakota? Bakota. Uh, Billy Barnes. Oh, no, just caring about the Baseball Hall of Fame is what broke That's me. That's fair. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, so being interested I, in the thing actually broke you of being interested in it? Okay. Yeah, I, because it was just like the arguments become so awful at some point. And once I realized that Kurt Schilling is eventually going to be in it, I was like, I can't care about this. I it, must it, stop caring about this. It really is something that, like, I, I've talked about this case before. Like, maybe it's, like, romanticizing, like, going to Cooperstown. Like, you're going, like, to the middle of nowhere, New York, to go see, like— this town that's built up around a hall of fame that's kind of romantic in a way but i it, i i got into a five-year off and on debate with my dad about barry bonds that pretty that, much that's what really broke me was yeah. the steroids thing it's just like, yeah I, I, and also what probably made me stop caring about baseball is just like I because can't. they didn't do enough of course they didn't do enough steroids <laughs> Exactly, exactly because they should have done more steroids that's my right take. yeah um so, the, yeah. The, the, the one hall of fame take that really destroys me especially like pa after his passing is the fact that the college football hall of fame has a requirement for coaches to have a certain win percentage to even be eligible for induction so it's not very fair to coaches that like make their name like building up programs you know and howard schnellenberger who recently passed on most known for being the architect of the University of Miami rise in the early 80s, is not in the College Football Hall of Fame because he went to Louisville, crashed out of Louisville trying to rebuild that program, spent a year at Oklahoma, and then finished his career getting paid really well to make uh, Florida Atlantic University into an actual college football team. So I just want to say that, frankly, that's what you deserve for going to work at Louisville. I mean, I can't. I I, I knew Sorry. I was I know I was giving my tone to some dangerous waters talking about no, how Schnell Schnellenberger is good in every hood because he uh he's also a UK guy so he's, yeah he, he's good I, everywhere he he was he was at U I think he played at UK right he did he played yeah. he played here yes so so I mean like you have to be okay with Howard Schnellenberger and also he was such a badass that he would bring a smoking pipe and he would intentionally leave it behind because they didn't believe in such things as like inadmissible benefits so he could go back and talk to people's uh go talk sure. to players and their parents. 
No, he was cool. No doubt about it. If you want more of our Howard Schnellenberger thoughts, you can find them as as Mike told you earlier at everything AEW. I'm at Aaron Lights the Car. Nate is at Epitasis. Mike is at Fuji Heya. Subscribe to the podcast so you get these as soon as they come out. Uh, if you use the Apple Podcast app, give us a five star rating and a review on there, please. And if you want to support the show, the best way to do so is to head over to patreon.com slash everything elite and subscribe. Uh, we'll kick off the show as we like to do with elite or delete. Uh, the idea is we just say what our favorite, least favorite things from the show were. Nate. Starting with you, what was your favorite thing? What's your elite pick this week? My elite selection for this week, um, uh, I think the match in which I was most interested, the uh, certainly one of the better work matches on the show, maybe the only match that really had a finish that was in doubt at any point, uh, obviously Hikaru Shida versus Tai Conti for the AEW Women's Championship. Um, I've said this before, but Tai Conti, her judo, background uh, always brings something fresh and different to all of her matches so it doesn't look like every other match on the show uh and both these women went out and had a bunch of cool looking spots that they put together for this uh she did, did a nice um i don't know what you would call it a, a, a it's almost like colt cabana chicago skyline move uh onto the turnbuckle uh causing ty to fall out of the ring that was pretty dope uh ty just you know laying in these sick knees and pump kicks always looks awesome. Um, and yeah, I actually had some doubt. A lot of people wanted to see Ty Conti win this match. So, you know, seemed like there was actually some stakes here. Um, of course it was, you know, right in the middle of the show. And, uh, I think Sheeta winning was the right move. I think, uh, like we discussed last week, you know, I, I want to see here, get to back to full arenas as the champion. She's pretty much carried the division. Um, throughout this pandemic period. So that's a nice, you know, sort of cherry on top for her. And then, you know, they did a great job after the match setting up Brit as now having risen, risen through the rankings and being a worthy challenger of Sheeta. So that's a great pay-per-view match. Brit is super hot. That's going to be, uh, you know, very hot with a full crowd if that's when they do it. And yeah, then you can come back to tie later. So I think that was the, the strongest thing here. Just want to be clear. Nate was not being horny. He, he's not saying Brit is very hot. Right. No. No, I would never say that. <laughs> Fam famously the famously unhot Britt Baker. She uh she has a lot of momentum right now. She does. It, it it's something that like they did such a great job of building up this match with the shoulder content and then taking the best parts of Road Two and just putting it on right before the match gave it a big match feel. And you know, this was exactly what I hoped for in this match, which was we got to see Ty Conti in a situation that lets her show how much she's really improved over the last uh, less than a year. I mean, that's the wild thing to think about. Like, really, like, we've only been truly exposed to Ty Conti like, less than a year, and she's, for lack of better terms, has learned on the job and has really flourished. Like, like she's, she's in no way a complete wrestler. Like, if I wanted to go through and nitpick certain things that she does that uh, I could, but for where she is and given, like, her experience level and given, like, her training beforehand, this was exceptional. And the finish looked brutal. Like, the, the, the fact that, like, the two of them were willing to just completely just go at it and work in some of the martial arts stuff from... Uh, the judo and the Brazilian jiu-jitsu from Ty and the way that Hikaru Shida was into it. And then, yeah, the witch's shot, like, backbreaker on the top turnbuckle looked brutal as hell. And then, you know, the katana, like, like the nice little flourish there for the katana as, like, a like a corkscrew knee strike was, like, a nice well, nice kill shot away of going, like, okay, no, this is over. And, you know, I went four and a quarter stars on this. I thought that this was really exceptional. And I hope that everyone when Hikaru Shida probably loses the title at double or nothing three like takes a step back and recognize like the work that she did as women's champion over the last year because it's truly outstanding stuff yeah she rules and I think you know, you're talking about how they kind of worked in some stuff that that worked for Ty and I think that's kind of the story of the Shida title reign other than just her carrying this division through the pandemic and being someone who could be uh, you know, at the face at as the actual face of the division for this whole time without crowds. But she also what makes her so good is that in all of these title matches, she works the match in the way that best fits the challenger. She always does something that uh, gives the challenger 
a, a credible look, uh, works toward their style so they can really shine, uh, and then beats them in a way that makes them look good. She's just excellent at it. Uh, so another great example of a Hikaru Shida title match. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of, you know, I don't, I try not to react to discourse too much, but I, I kind of annoyed people like, oh, they need to change the, they need to change the title. They need to change the title just because, you know, people, people have not, have not seen a title change recently enough. So just like, oh yeah, you know, put on tie. Um, and I, I, I hate changing a title for no reason uh, other than, uh, you know, lack of recent title changes. That's the worst reason to do it. Um, and, you know, the failings of the women's division are not on Hikaru Ishida. All she does is, uh, you know, go out and have great matches with whatever challenge that they've built up. The failings are, you know, as ever, just not having enough time to build enough stories where the whole division feels hot. You know, it, it's very silly to me to put that at Hikaru Ishida's feet um, and say, oh, the, the division needs a shot in the arm. They got to get the belt off her. It has nothing to do with her. All she did is, you know, go to Japan and put together a whole tournament to try and build some people up and get a hot challenger and then, you know, have good matches with all of her challengers. So that's silly to me. So, yeah, like I said, glad to see her retain here and hope uh, hope the big Brit and Cheetah match delivers in a big way because I think it could. That's the one thing I'll give AW credit for with regard to the women's division is that even though they've fucked it up at every turn, they haven't sh- uh, hot shotted the belt around to try to add some excitement. You know, in the Road 2 video, which part of that was on Dynamite, I don't think this part was. No, it was. This part was where uh, Ty talked about the lineage of the AW women's title. And when they show Riho and then Nyla and then Sheeta, you're like, oh, yeah, this belt really does mean something. Like it has that credibility as a as a women's world title so i think they've done at least a good job with that whatever happened to nyla rose i t- couldn't tell you that i guess that's their major uh downfall of the the women's division lineage is nyla is uh is but a memory weird mike what was your favorite thing from this week's episode you know there were a lot of little things in this episode that when we get into like the overall review unless we talk about beforehand that like popped me in a lot of different ways because you know i look at the factory and i sincerely enjoy this group of absolute goons here i enjoy the fact that ricky starks comes out here but nate took the easy one i feel like like i feel like that that by acclamation the best thing on the show was the women's world title match so i'm gonna talk about the opener i really enjoyed it uh ricky starks versus hangman page they've done the the one thing about like this episode of Dynamite that I felt like that they did was everything, even if you're even like Billy Gunn versus QT Marshall had a reason to be on the show rather than, well, we're going to just have like these random up and comers face off or we're going to just have like this match because we're going to have to see this match. Everything here had a reason and they've done a great job of building up with something that I personally don't believe they do a great job of implementing all the time and both win loss records and rankings and building up this hangman page versus ricky starks match both those guys came in on an absolute hot streak and both and both of them like came together and it wasn't necessarily like the smoothest match but i think the credit goes to like ricky uh being able to like identify like oh okay i went down kind of awkwardly on my ankle i'm going to like really make this look like oh man i messed up my ankle or my neck completely like bent the weird way on that uh, on that like the dead shot and that made into it and i felt like that the match i came off very well i mean it was a very fast opener it was like third it was entirely within the first quarter hour if i'm right and felt like it was truly like satisfying and in a way that i enjoyed like the idea of now we have this thing where we have like these two groups that we don't necessarily like see the path forward for both uh team taz and especially the dark order right now but if you're going to have more of these matches between members of the groups i'm having a great time with them and i thought that this was a strong opener yeah pretty pretty good match um i did like you know they gave ricky a little bit of an out with the with the ankle thing uh and they did they came up with some nice little reversal sequences um especially toward the finish when Paige sort of used the turnbuckle to kick out of uh, or sort of kick away from Ricky and then get the leverage on him and end up uh, putting him in the submission. So I did like that. Um, they do, they give Paige a bunch of featured singles matches, which is good. 
because, you know, he's a guy that they're building up to be, uh, you know, top singles guy. Uh, and they always, they book him strong. He's the matches are always laid out in a way that's like, you know, Adam Page is a better wrestler than his opponent and he won the match for that reason. Um, but it, it has been a little bit since I've really seen an Adam Page match that really like excited me and fired me up. Um, I would like to, I don't know if he needs a different opponent for, or if it's on him. I, maybe, I guess the last one was maybe that uh, Page and Omega match from the pay-per-view. And even that was like, you know, they left stuff on the table intentionally, but you could tell that they did. So, yeah, I would like to see like something that really stirs my soul for Adam Page. I think Page is just cold right now. I think this whole Dark Order thing has not, you know, taken off in any way. It's kind of like uh, just been stuck in quicksand for some yeah. time. And it's like hard to get excited about him. They did. I mean, you know, it's like any sitcom or whatever they did the big will they won't they thing with them where dark Rota wanted him to join uh and they did the very memorable thing where they asked him in the ring and proposed to him and he said no and they did the big celebration he said yes um and then it was like okay well we're we're just going to resolve this he's going to be friends with benefits with the dark order he's going to be not really in the group but he's going to pal around with them all the time um and yeah you know since then silver's been out so as mike said you know the dark order is kind of kind of rudderless at the moment and yeah maybe adam page is kind of uh suffering by association i said the match was good it's just that i think i think it's because of that 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 adam page does feel uh rudderless that it's like i'd like to see ricky starks win one of these matches it feels like he has these matches occasionally where he's up against another guy on like a similar footing or slightly above him and he he never comes out on top which is fine but it's like at some point i'd like to see Ricky Starks get a real, uh, real go. Yeah. Team Taz taking a lot of L's hard to, you know, they, all these guys are like, Oh yeah, they're infinity and zero on dark, but then you put them on TV, they always lose. <laughs> yes. That's uh, something I, again, that I'm going to talk about soon. Uh, okay. That's my, it's my turn to talk about what I really liked. Uh, you know, I think I'm going to go with, I hated the, uh, Christian Cage and Frankie Kazarian match. I think I made that very clear how miserable I thought it was. Uh, this match with Powerhouse Hobbs, I really liked. I thought it kind of it played to Cage's strengths in a lot of way, a lot of ways, which are frankly selling to make other people look good, which was you know not the point of the Kaz match. And Hobbs played his role exquisitely. It's like Hobbs is one of the few guys that they keep pretty fresh. You know, he's not like constantly wrestling on television. And so I was genuinely excited when he came out. I was like, oh, hell yeah, uh, Will Hobbs match. This rules. And he delivered. He looked like a monster. Christian Cage helped him look like a monster. Um, you know, I get it. They're high on Cage. I think if Hobbs just won this match, that would have been cooler. Uh, but this, I think, would have been a much more effective way to debut Christian than the Cavs match because he – gets beaten down. You still have that whole story of like, Ooh, does he still have it? But he's able to sneak out that win at the end. That's like, okay, uh, he's, he can get back on his feet. So I think this would have been more successful, uh, at least for me, you know, I just enjoyed it a lot more. Yeah. I don't know if hard to say if, if I would have preferred it as his first match. Um, it did. It, it, I think Hobbs was the highlight of this. Uh, and I guess that was partly the purpose but, you know, I talked about how I really liked Ty and Sheeta, especially because there was a genuine question as to the as to the ultimate winner. Um, this match, I had no question whatsoever. I, you know, probably tuned out of it uh, a couple of times because I'm like, I know exactly what this match is going to be. It's going to be uh, Christian Cage down and selling and down and selling and down and selling and down and selling. Uh, and he's going to come back and he's going to hit his move and he won. And that's what happened. So. I was not. I was not moved by this match. I was my, my soul. My soul was not stirred uh, by this match. But uh, it, you know, what you take away from this really is like, oh man, Powerhouse Hobbs. He's got some cool spots. He, he looks like a monster. He makes some great facials. Um, uh, that he's going to lose. That uh, whatever. Okay. Just to kind of talk about Aaron's point about how they've kept Hobbs fresh and. That was like my takeaway from this match. It's just kind of like hammer at home here. And it kind of resonates in a way because if you're someone who watches the 
four hours of auxiliary content or ancillary content as chris jericho would say or ancillary i feel like that's how he pronounced it anyways uh you you notice that with hobbs and it's very distinctive because hobbs is like the one person that they truly like do this with because they'll have some people just like come in and absolutely squash people on dark and elevation and it's fine move on life but with Hara with hobbs they do this and then whenever there is a team ties tag team or trios match he's only in for like two to three minutes of it like he's only in basically to get his shit in like no pun intended there so then you have this match against christian that and you have a match that goes over 10 minutes here and you get to see more things you're like wow hobbs when like they well when like their stricter play is off is a truly dynamic wrestler and christian you know as ab as you said just really set him up for success there and i mean it's it, it, I, I guess with Christian's gimmick being the fact that he's good at having matches, congratulations! Now you're up to you're up to 500 and being outworking everyone and making everything look great. So, but yeah, no, I felt like that 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 on this show that there's some stuff that you really could nitpick here. I look at this match and other than Christian hitting the move and winning, I felt like that for for like what this match set out to accomplish, I felt like he did a great job of that. This is like not timely, but if we, if I had been on a podcast, I don't know, however many years it was, 10 years ago, I would have been complaining about every John Cena match just being the guy down and selling and down and selling and down and selling. And then, you know, Cena slipping out of the dude's finisher and hitting me one FU and winning the match and complaining about that. And I probably would have been complaining about it from the perspective of a Christian fan and going, no, Christian's so much better. He's got to beat John Cena. I can't believe he, you know, John Cena took all those moves from Christian. Uh, and then just beat him in one move. Uh, so it is kind of funny in a cosmic way to see Christian on the other end of that. I was thinking earlier today, Nate, about your famous tweet. I meant to look for it about... Um, about uh, Dolph Ziggler and Snooki. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, about the... Is that the same tweet as the uh, don't say the name of a move to me? <laughs> yeah, don't say the fucking... Yeah. Uh, that the best wrestler in the world is a 55-year-old <laughs> fat man in a skeleton suit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Great tweet. It's one I think about with some regularity. Thanks. Uh, listener elite of the week, listener Gosh Punk, who says uh, his choice was, or their choice was, uh, I don't know, Gosh Punk, uh, your, uh, your pronoun, so I will not assume. Uh, but the really gnarly way Billy Gunn took that pile driver from QT. I loved that, like, pick out of this, like, little thing from that match. I had such a good time with this match. <laughs> like, it's just, like, Billy Gunn, just like being like an absolute galoof against a bunch of absolute galoofs, and yeah, like he made the the pile driver look sick as hell. And then we got uh, the, and then we got uh, what was I about to say? Then we got Joker face paint, Dustin Rhodes coming out here. Like, how can't you like watch like this absolute insanity and just be like, okay, this is just sit down and just like your eyes can't move away as Mister Freak Beast takes a chair shot to his head, a wooden chair that splinters and doesn't bother him whatsoever. Uh, you know, and if you're feeling Joker-fied and you just want to watch the world burn, there's nothing better to do while the world burns. Then make some money over at MyBookie. Our friends there have a promo code that you can use, ELITE. It'll get you a deposit bonus up to $1,000. Just make sure you use the promo code ELITE. Uh, what do we got going on now? I guess baseball is still in full swing. NBA, we're inching toward the playoffs. So, you know, that'll be exciting when that finally comes up. I, uh, oh, wait, I guess this is time for me to take my victory lap on the uh, the F1 race from this past week. I tried to tell all our listeners that Max Verstappen would win. You should bet on him. Uh, we had some real haters and losers uh, in DMs, like uh, formerly featured in this spot, Cousin Weed Mouse, uh, who told me not to bet on Max, that, that Lewis Hamilton would win. But Cousin Weed Mouse, as he often was on the lock of the week, was wrong. And uh, Max Verstappen won. If you had listened to me and used the promo code ELITE, uh, you could have made some money over at, at my bookie. Mike, did you follow AB's pick of the week? I did not have money on this race, but I was with you. I was with you the whole way. When we were talking about something, I was like, yeah, no, because of what was happening at Imola, like as long as the uh, Red Bull doesn't go out, uh, it's Verstappen's race to win. And what we say RBR didn't go out. The Sappen won by 22 seconds. It wasn't the the race was very rarely in doubt after a late restart. Like he just completely did like this. However, I I do have to say 
Lando Norris making third. We, we love to see it. We love seeing that the Zoomer made the podium this week. And, you, you, you know, sometimes you just got to go, go with, like, your your angry Dutch analog to uh, Dale Earnhardt if Dale Earnhardt's used a lot of Game reward swears. Sure. Uh, this weekend, you can get, um, or I guess it must be next weekend, right? Um, Portugal. Portimao. Uh, yeah, Portimao. Yeah, yeah. Is next Portugal's weekend. next weekend, yeah. You got Lewis and Max <laughs> at plus 120. So, you know, you can kind of take your pick. I'll have to think next week I'll have my, I'll have my pick. Yeah, they're both on at plus one. 120 right now. Uh, Portimao is not a very interesting track other than people like, hey, they're back at Portimao. But, uh, I mean, yeah, sure. I mean, I'm more interested in if we can do a head-to-head uh, Valtteri Votas versus our boy George next week. That's a bet I want to make. Yeah, there we go. But I will let you know, you can still get Max in the Drivers' Championship at plus 110. So maybe maybe worth a look. But make sure you use the promo code ELITE over at MyBookie and get your uh, bonus deposit up to $1,000. All right, let's talk about the things we didn't like. I thought this was a weird show in that I liked quite a bit of it uh if not most of it there wasn't a ton that i really hated uh so i kind of had uh, i struggled a little looking for things i really didn't like mine Nate, was easy was yours okay M- good mine was easy they they put the qvc guy with pentagon zero pentagon junior penta el zero miedo um which to me is insane mike proposed this on the show a few weeks ago and i called him insane i said mike you sound insane you cannot put the QVC guy with the with the other great skeleton man. They did it though. They did, they did it. it. I was right. And I, I, mean... I, you were. I guess you were right that they did it. Yeah. You, you were wrong in that it would be good. It's super awkward. Uh, it's very goofy. It kills Penta's swag and aura to have. I mean, you know, Alex Abrahantes. God bless him. I'm sure a nice guy. You know, seems to work hard. Obviously has a role in the company doing important things between the Spanish commentary and, uh, you know, what other his other his other duties are. He does the post um, show on YouTube on Weekside State. Sure. He, he, he can be, you know, he, he's got a Chris Van Vleetness to him. Um, I would not have Chris Van Vliet out here managing Pentel Zero Miedo. Uh, that's insane to me. You, th- th- this guy has two other people in his stable who are charismatic uh, and perceived as, you know, being actual tough wrestlers and cool. Um, <laughs> Alex Abrahantes just has the crazy pants. He's like, he's like bopping to Penta's song. Like it's a, you know, comedy act. Um, it, I, I, but I, I don't know. I, I tweeted about this and I basically got ratioed on the tweet. Uh, and I couldn't believe it. I, I, I cannot believe people are so into the QVC guy. Uh, and it's particularly galling that this this th- they, this was the missing link to getting Pentagon some wins. It's like, oh, now he's got now he's got the QVC dude is out here hitting people with a microphone like he's Don Callis. Now we can get behind Pentagon. This is really yeah. got elevated the act to the level where Pentagon can get some wins. He couldn't. He couldn't beat an inji- injured Cody Rhodes after doing his arm breaker spot to the injured arm. Cody still had to win that, even though Cody was immediately leaving TV. Um, but now that Alex Abrahantes is there to point at his T-shirt and, uh, you know, just totally tank the cool factor of Pentagon, uh, he can win. That it crazy to me. It blew my mind. So... I was feeling pretty high on the horse, pretty heidi tidy when Alex Aberhantis came out there and they did the whole Penta says thing and he came out like an absolute like smarmy asshole. I was like, all right, I was digging this until partway through the match when he decided to do like a Sue Marcello joke to get Trent mad and then the finish there, which like you're absolutely right about like that. I was I was really enjoying this up until Alex Abrahantes like grabbed the microphone mid match and cut a promo. Like <laughs> also the content like is, is so you know saying yeah. your, your mom sucks. I get that. That's gonna piss the guy off. That's like you know machismo one oh one. Somebody insults yeah. your mother. You got to get pissed about it. But before I got there, he he laid in the devastating lines of, "Hey, you're you suck and your friends really suck." And I was quite cringe. It was like entirely cringe. It was like 
really? This is what we're doing? Like, <laughs> remember when Pentagon was like setting the world on fire and having like, you know, bloodbath death matches with Vampiro and was like the coolest, most dangerous guy in wrestling? Mm-hmm. Uh, and now he's just like, I don't know, he's, he's got the world fucking Klish Van Vliet or Don West or something. Yeah. And, It's something where, like, I like the idea in theory about the guy who is basically like his his entire role, his affiliation is that he is he works as like Penta has done commentary, done Spanish commentary for the company. So like, uh, it it it's it's like a pre established thing. It's like, hey, yeah, no, my partner here is more fluent. He's going to be the one translating it, and he comes off like a completely smarmy asshole. But then like everything that happened after that with Abrahanta is just completely just falls flat and it kind of took away a lot from a match i'm like trent versus penta they're gonna go do dumb stuff and they did dumb stuff but then you had all that all the alex from qvc stuff that pulled it down a lot also like he can be in the role of translating stuff for live promos as necessary here's the thing like most of penta's promos are gonna be backstage pre-tapes just let him yell in spanish and sound like a badass and you can subtitle when it's a pre-tape if he's in the ring talking to a live crowd, then yes, have Alex Abrahante stand up at the desk and he can translate as necessary. He doesn't have to be part of the act. <laughs> Just crazy to me. I, it's, 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 uh, it boggles the mind, Aaron. All right. I'm of, I'm of two minds here. One. Are, are either of them boggled? Um, no, I'm not. I'm unboggled. Wow. Uh, one is, yes, they should just have, Pinta is just cool as fuck and he should just yell in Spanish. That's the best use of, of Pinta. The other is, I'm, uh, this is a pro Alex account. This is, I enjoy Alex. I think he's funny. Um, I don't know. They, uh, they're running with it, buddy. They got Pinta says t-shirts. This ain't going away. I can't believe it. Uh, but the in but the mid match thing was very bad. (laughs) It was like. Twitter was like a blaze of people raving about Alex Armahantes and him saying Pinta says. Yeah, that's that's big over, my friend. It's super over. Whereas you have a guy like Roosh who has a real money catchphrase, which is nothing happens and, and everybody's quiet. I can't I don't get it. Sorry, bud. I've been there. I mean, I know how it feels. Uh Mike, what was your least favorite thing of the show? I just the the pinnacle and inner circle stuff like the leaders of it just don't do anything for me. Then you have background guys like Wardlow and Satana c- coming off like absolute mega stars, and I'm just going like, why? Well, we've had enough of the Jericho and MJF histronics. Why don't like more of like Santana and like talking about Wardlow and having those two guys promo like that would have been more interesting to me, and then. Like, having, like, a parlay, which, you know, like, as someone who did a fair bit of classical studies work in college, like, I'm well, I'm well versed in the idea of a, of a parlay, but, like, the idea of, like, Jericho definitely, like, got this idea from watching, like, the one episode of Game of Thrones where there was a parlay. It was like, oh, yeah, we're going to have a fight where we hash out the rules before we do Blood and Guts, and we, and the whole idea about, like, Blood and Guts, like, completely, the idea that it's going to be a one-match show has or like they, they presented it like it's going to be a one match show here and just like they were at the end line that you were already in the you were already scored the touchdown in the way that they kind of like built those up and having like all the blood for that and having you know inner circle somewhat like to various degrees coming off like complete badasses and then you know having a uh, pinnacle sit around and uh director's chairs as Wardlow is cutting like a decent promo to MJF just like doing his same spiel that just doesn't resonate anymore and then Jericho just going out there and like l- forgetting the lines of a show tune he made up there and just le- le- leads you to think like what are we even doing here at a certain point yeah I, I can't complain about the inner circle segment because Wardlow stole it to me Wardlow was tremendous um, just he, his poise and his manner his his the way he's collected and just so confident and he's a megastar yeah superstar energy from wardlow next day batista they need to strap this guy up before he gets a marvel movie um that's where we're at with wardlow so and you know have talked a lot about mjf promos on the show i don't even mjf's being 
super dialed up and you know intense and angry in his promo here i i think is fine mostly because it served the purpose of uh really making wardlow distinct and like mjf is screaming and pissed off and then wardlow's like oh i'm I'm super cool by the way over here i'm a big star i don't know if you know wardlow wardlow trending on twitter mjf not so i can't i can't really complain about the inner circle uh segment of that or not the pinnacle segment the pinnacle segment of it uh with respect to the inner circle line inner circle segment jericho basically echoed our complaints about mjf which is that yeah you know you You've got the content of your promos. You've got, you're all dialed up. You've got the histrionics. You're so angry, but I just don't feel the conviction. I don't feel the authenticity of it. Um, and he's right. That's what I've complained about on this show. So uh, I think Jericho took that note from me. So, uh, you know, I can't bury it. I just really hate, this is like present in so many AW stories where the characters are actually feuding about parts about their characters. And it's like, I don't care if, like, there's a way for Chris Jericho to say, I don't believe you when you say that versus your promos aren't as good as you think they are because you don't have that level of belief. You know, like there's there's a different way to do that. And MJF being like, uh, I am a mark. I'm a mark for your spot. It's like, what the fuck are we talking about? Like, I don't understand. Like, I don't understand why the characters can't just feud about things that wrestlers feud about rather than right. about wrestling I, that's what i don't like right there, it, it is an entire promotion that is targeted at you know wrestling fans who listen to wrestling podcasts like this one and know the wrestling terminology and think about wrestling in terms of who's a good promo and who has the good work right it's a promotion for those people so i do kind of understand like well if we're gonna if we're gonna introduce some element of reality into our stories to make it like, you know, seem like a real heated issue between these two people, then it makes sense for those elements to be there. But it does, it is like just kind of annoying to be like, Oh yeah, they're feuding over who's actually a good promo and, right. uh, and, and, you know, who's a mark for who or whatever there is. This is an obnoxious thing to say, but like in Japanese wrestling, when you get the promos translated, they really blur the lines. Well, where it's like, they talk about, you know, sh- shoot aspects of the business, but cloak them in like worked terms. So it can be like, oh, you know, I don't feel his conviction in the ring. And they're talking about, oh, you know, I think this guy stinks or whatever. But they do a much better job, I think, of kind of playing to both sides. Now. Like Tanahashi does a great job with it. Amy Sakura does a great job of stuff like that, where it's like she's talking about real life things. Mace Ruga did right after the AEW tournament, talking about how she wasn't satisfied with her performance and stuff. And uh, all that, all that was super interesting. The stuff they said on their live stream. Um, and they just blur that line really well, where it's like, they're talking about shoot things in wrestling. They're talking about their, their, their performance as performers, but they, they just wrap it in this veil of, but in a worked pro wrestling uh, context, that's just uh, goes down much smoother. Cause you can have it either way you want it. And you know it's good because every Mark on Twitter who's like a big Japanese wrestling fan is like personally offended by these promos. <laughs> That's always funny. <laughs> okay, I guess it's my turn. Um, here's my big picture thing. And I will use it to uh, address a petty grievance. So my big picture thing. So unlike you. Yeah, very unlike me. So my big picture thing is, yes, I have talked at length about one of my favorite things is Darby against a big guy. And he really has to struggle to like figure out because of his size, how he's going to beat this person, but he wins in the end and it's beautiful. Right. But I really struggle to see what the point of that is in a match with fucking jungle boy that I really don't see the point. Not only is jungle boy, not substantially bigger than Darby in any real way, but he's not booked anywhere near the level of Darby. Like, it's not close. Uh, our good friend and patron, Swarles in the Discord, tried to tell me that MJ, or MJF shit, Jungle Boy, has been booked as an upper mid-card babyface ever since he came in the company. So, I figured I would look at all the singles matches that Jungle Boy has had on television or pay-per-view since he's been in the company. Let me read them off for you. MJF defeats Jungle Boy. MJF defeats Jungle Boy. Cody defeats Jungle Boy. 
Wardlow defeats Jungle Boy. Jungle Boy defeats Dax Harwood. Those are all, every single singles match Jungle Boy has ever had on television or pay-per-view. Didn't yes, he have Nate? a 10-minute 10, 10 time limit match with Jericho after he... Remember he had a he had a match yeah. with Jericho on an early dynamite. It, it was a New Year's thing, and it was the idea that if Jericho yeah, the last, if you could last ten minutes with Chris Jericho, right? Yes. Yeah, that's true. That's not on cage match for whatever reason. That's Under weird. Single oh. matches. Huh. The inmates, what are you doing? Come on, inmates. I know. Straighten up. Well, my so, my, you, my overall yeah. point is Jungle Boy is not booked at, at that level. He's not an upper mid card babyface. He's just not. He's never he hasn't beaten anybody except FTR Bald, who is a tag wrestler. So Darby should be able to beat this person more easily. I appreciate Darby comes from behind. I appreciate it was the main event of the show. You got to do a good match. I uh, understand all that. You don't have to put Jungle Boy in that spot or or you build Jungle Boy up before the match. That's the other possibility. They didn't do any of that. So this match was like, oh, it's fun. They did a good job of having a, a wrestling match that was fun to watch. Maybe this is similar to what we we're talking about a minute ago, Nate, that the way this uh, show is booked is for people like us, even though I'm the one complaining about it. So it was a good performance of a wrestling match, but on a from a kayfabe work perspective, it doesn't make a lot of sense. I definitely should have used the word kayfabe more when I was trying to talk about worked <laughs> worked versus shoot storyline aspects. Um, yeah, you know, I it, it didn't uh, chafe again on me. Uh, I think just because I have in my head, Jungle Boy is an ascendant babyface, but he's maybe you know he's not to that top level yet. But they clearly want him to get there. And yeah, he, he took a bunch of losses, but I think by you know being opposite Cody and Jericho and stuff like that, we knew even at the beginning he's like he's somebody that they're going to build and invest in. So. You know, as as a as a stop, as a story beat in that sort of arc for Jungle Boy, where you know he gets a title challenge against maybe a guy who's beatable, and he doesn't doesn't beat him, but he has like a, a valiant match in the main event. I think that's like a, a you know a fine next step for Jungle Boy. So it didn't bother me in that way. I thought the match was pretty good. Yeah. But when does Darby just beat somebody? And if it isn't Jungle Boy, who the yeah. hell is it? Well, I I guess maybe they just don't they don't think that's what appeals to Darby that that is like we said this is a promotion designed for people who are like big into work rate or whatever so like all the matches have to go a minimum of 12 minutes um you know we just don't see people get dominant wins on dynamite it, do, it doesn't happen it, you know it's very rare they did a couple squatches last week uh with the women especially and we were like this is a breath of fresh air this is great we can see who the stars are uh, but that's that's just not their pattern of booking weekend. I, I guess for me, like Aaron, you, you have illustrated points. I agree with you a lot better than I can. But with something like Jungle Boy, and I'm not saying that this is something that will be an issue in 2021 or 2022 or 2023, but Jack Perry as this kind of character has a lifespan to it and if you're going to build him up as like this up and coming baby face at a certain time then he needs to have certain wins that are better than against a tag team guy or going to a draw a year and a half ago that's not even represented on any archives and that frankly i felt like that aaron probably completely forgot about it until he was like where is this match didn't he have a match here but it's just something that like even the build for this match on like row two and everything else was just kind of like Darby doing the heavy lifting because like there was a really solid like Darby standard Darby black and white promo talking about his match of jungle boy and how jungle boy needs to bring it, how jungle boy needs to bring it. And then you have like jungle boy on row two cutting just like, maybe I just don't see it in jungle boy. Maybe that that's my own predilection that like, I see like everyone's talking about him as upper comer and I just like look at these things and I'm like, He's good in the ring, and of course, he will always have that name cachet, but at a certain point here, I need to see a level of progression if he's going to be like this, like future megastar. And I don't know if that's going to really ever happen with him, whereas you, you put him directly across the ring from Darby Allen, where it's patently obvious that they've went from someone who was getting beat all the damn time by Cody Rhodes and finally like transcending that and becoming... You know, I mean, he main evented 
dynamite the last two weeks. He is someone that was in the semi main event in the last pay per view. Like he's a he's a capital S capital S superstar. So like, it, it, I I maybe this is my own thing. I just don't see this ever really happening at this point. Like, I'm off base and thinking like what we're seeing is what we're getting out of Jungle Boy at this point. At least as in this iteration of him. Yeah, I think so. I think he's uh, really strong in the ring more often than not. Uh, and I think I really think the Jungle Boy gimmick has a lot of charm to it. The it's it's a very old school kind of thing, very out of another era. Uh, but I think it kind of works. Maybe that's because he's you know like an old Hollywood guy. It's like oh, he's a throwback to a a, a Silver Age or a Golden Age or a different time, something like that. Uh, but that that appeals to me. I I you know I don't think he's a, a, a strong promo where they can put him out in the ring and give him the bike and be like, okay, build your match um, right now. And, you know, be really genuine and, uh, you know, stir somebody's soul with what you have to say about it. He, he can't do that uh, yet. I don't know if he will be able to do that at some point, uh, but they also don't give a lot of guys the opportunity to do that anyway. Um, so I, if there's something that's holding him back and I don't think it is yet, but I do think there's a shelf life to the the Jurassic Express uh, uh, formation. Um, yeah. So at, at some point, you'd have to break away from that. But, um, you know, JR always goes out <laughs> and says, oh, it's Jungle Boy Jack. I think that's fine. That, 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 I think that's totally viable. Uh, and he's got the rest of the tools. It, it, this is a complete aside. But are we kind of at a point where a lot of, like, these storylines and characters after – nearly two years might be ready to see like the next step or move on because i feel like what you said about jurassic express start of kind of getting that feeling and a lot of that is because john silver isn't around and he kind of is the magnet of the screen but you're starting to see that with dark order as well i would say yeah they certainly need to figure out something to do with dark order it's like overstuffed and they lost the guy they were pushing out of it um I don't really want to throw in the towel on Jurassic Express yet just because Luchasaurus was so over <laughs> with the crowds and we haven't had crowds. Um, so, I'm, you know, there's a lot of things I give, I, I, I'm patient with. Also, I'm, I don't need, we need, we need a, a moratorium on unit breakup stories for a while. So they can't do that either. Um, Agreed. Yeah. So stay the course. They just got to be patient with it. At some point, we're going to get back to crowds and we're going to be able to see what's genuinely over and what's working and what's not. Uh, and then you can course correct as necessary. Uh, Andrew in the YouTube chat says he could buy Jungle Boy rising to the occasion and giving Darby a tougher than expected match. And I agree that that is like a good story. And they did that with uh, with Chris Jericho. You know, when he had that match with Chris Jericho, Darby also did that match with Chris Jericho, you know, early on in, in Darby's run. Uh, but I think it feels different in this because it's the match that Darby wrestles every match that he has. So it doesn't feel as much. I don't think it helps Jungle Boy as much. Now, I'm kind of writing two lines here because I'm mostly speaking to people who've like watched all the shows because that's the only way you're even going to know how Jungle Boy is booked, right? So a new person tuning in isn't even going to know what a normal Darby match looks like. So maybe that does you know, make Jungle Boy pop for them. Uh, but I think for your person who watches most of the shows, it, not sure it gave Jungle Boy as much as it could have. Uh, yeah, in a, with a different wrestler on, uh, on the other side of the ring. I would love to see just more, more matches that are 80, 20 instead of 50, 50. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, you look at like, what, what was Cody versus Warhorse? Like 14 minutes and, and 60, 40. Like they just don't, yeah. they don't do that. Uh, and it's too bad that the, the match where Darby Allen squashed Will Hobbs before he like joined the roster on dark, like, a Darby squash, even against a bigger guy, can be very engaging. Uh, but they're just, they're not, they don't think that that works on television for whatever reason. And, you know, I, I don't, maybe it doesn't work in the main event for a title. That kind of makes sense to me. But it would be nice to see just more of those sort of varied, uh, you know, more uneven or more dominant matches just sprinkled in between all the big work rate offs. Our listener, D. Lee, Sean Thurman, says, uh, Mr. Freak Beast not putting both of the little guns through a wall. Yeah, that definitely should have happened. Uh, as much as I love the guns, uh, love, love, as Mike was talking about, Mr. Freak Beast eating the chair. Um, 
<laughs> is there any reason that they had a wooden chair except that they didn't want to do a, a steel chair shot? Uh, I think they were emulating Dusty Rhodes and Ming from back in the day. Oh, ah, okay. Yeah. They, they do love emulating old Dusty Rhodes shit, so that makes sense. Um, but yeah, I was just like, hmm, a wooden chair has appeared here for the first time ever. <laughs> oh, what a coincidence. It broke over somebody's head. That's very convenient. Well, Mr. Freak Beast, if you're listening, support for everything Elite is brought to you by Manscaped. Who there is the we best go. In men's below the waist grooming. I mean, I can't speak to what Mr. Freak Beast looks like below the waist. Well, I can below the waist, but just not, you know, between the trunks. Don't know what he's looking like in there. But, Mr. Freak Beast, uh, if you need some help there, uh, you can go to manscaped.com, use the promo code This Is, you'll get 20% off and free shipping. Uh, they sent us a bunch of stuff. They sent us the perfect package 3.0. So we know a lot about, uh, how it works. And I mean, everybody, I think knows how, uh, grooming your balls works, but you know, if you need to, then this is the best way to do it because you got the cutting edge ceramic blade. The key here, you're going to make sure you don't cut your balls while you're shaving them, which is what you need. Mr. Freebeast wears white gear. He can't come out there with, you know, little droplets of blood on his white gear. I mean, that's for later in the match, right? I mean, everybody bleeds in AEW, but you don't want to bleed before your match, Mr. Freak Beast. So use the cutting edge ceramic blade. The LED light is going to get you a precise shave. Uh, and then on top of that, not just a lawnmower 3.0 do they offer. You also get the crop preserver, which is an anti-chafing ball deodorant. It's got a nice little smell. Keeps, you know, the in now, Mr. Free Beast, I know your thighs rub against each other. I mean, you're a big dude. You got the nice big thighs. So you need some anti-chafing. And he's in Nashville and he's in Jacksonville, you know. I mean yeah. Sweat. I, yeah, I I mean, like it's something I was talking to family in South Florida this weekend. I mean, it's already just suffocating weather in South Florida. So, I mean, he's going to be needing to have like that. I mean, and it's not just uh, like the crop preserve and the crop cleanser, crop reviver they have. They also have like feet stuff. Like, can you imagine like someone like Mr. Freak Beast, like the the fact of like just like a wrestling locker room, the feet smell you probably have at a certain point. So you can get the foot duster and that can make sure, you know, your feet are your feetsies are still smelling nice and clean. I mean, we're just looking out for our favorite local accountant slash freak beast here. Like, there's a lot of, of stuff that he could be using here. And when he does, I hope he uses promo code This Is and gets 20% off and free shipping. Be like the freak beast. Your balls will thank you. All right, let's run down uh, the rest of the show. As we said, it started off with Ricky Starks versus Hangman Page. Page one with a combination bulldog choke and toe hold. After the match, Taz says Page got lucky. He should watch his back. And Hook attacks from behind. Uh, Cage comes out. He's going to powerbomb uh, Page, but the Dark Order makes the save. Uh, Hook here rocking the uh, tank top and leather pants. You know, just what, what a fashion icon he is. And, you know, I mean, this gives, as I said earlier, this is giving two kind of aimless units at this point kind of large. And, Actually, like I kind of like how they built off this for the other for the Hobbs cage match later on in the show. I feel like that they kind of made this work into something where it's in the, that they're like, no, we can't have you around here. So I, I thought that this was a pretty effective post match. We see the elite arriving, going in their own trailer, and they are pointing out to us that Brandon Cutler is their personal cameraman. Uh, next up, Trent versus Pentagon, uh, and Penta one with the package pile driver after uh, some of the various shenanigans that we mentioned earlier uh i just want to say trent underrated as a singles guy uh, is always very good in singles matches i was talking to uh, our friend thoros earlier about you know the the aborted new japan run because of uh injuries uh, you know as usual for trent and you kind of i just would have liked to have seen how how high um our friend trent could have could have flown in new japan but we'll never know justin roberts brought back the question mark when he was announcing him i don't think he's been he doing did. that but he's the trend it stood out to me so i also don't think he has been uh, has he had the question mark for his previous chirons yeah he, he yeah. did they've, they've used it intermittently it that hasn't been consistent but they have had trent as a thing sorry trent that's better <laughs> that's about better, better enunciation <laughs> the, the I mean, first one was fine Okay, there we go. Th thanks, Nate. I appreciate it. I was trying to help you with your uh, 
Fuck, what's it? Speaking to audio, is that what it was? Voice to audio. Voice, voice audio. audio. Voice to audio. I mean, I mean, you have to put voice to audio. I mean, it is a visual medium, so you have to have voice to audio. It is. Uh, we're going to change the name of our podcast to Voices of Audio. <laughs> uh, Jim Ross is with the Pinnacle. MJF gets a new silk Burberry scarf, which frankly, I couldn't really tell the difference between the two scarves from TV. Any thoughts on that? No, no comments. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, we talked about this. Wordlow uh, says Jericho's promo was good, but he stumbled over his words when he got to Wordlow because he was scared. Uh, MJF says Jericho just wrestles guys who are already popular. True. Um, but they're the best best faction in wrestling, and MJF is a mark for Chris Jericho's spot, and he's going to take it. Yeah, I mean, basically, oh, no. <laughs> getting the hard sell for, is that, uh, for Chris that. Jericho wrestled Jungle Boy. Should be discussed. He was wrestled Isaiah Cassidy on television. True. Chris Jericho's like <laughs> gone out of his way to wrestle a lot of undercard guys. To be honest, he wrestled Scorpio Sky early on after dropping a pen to Scorpio Sky. That's right. We saw part of the Ty and uh, Sheeta video from Road 2 where Ty put over the women's title lineage and Sheeta put over Ty, but says, you know, she's not going to beat her this time. Maybe, you know, she'll be able to win the title in the future, but not today. And we follow that up with the women's world title match, Hikaru Sheeta versus Ty Conti. And Sheeta was correct. She won with a katana. Uh, after the match, Britt came out, the rankings came up on the screen, and then we saw Britt move up to number one. Sheeta threw a kendo stick at her. And folks, we have our first official match, I think, for Double or Nothing. Now, is that an official ranking change when when the Tron showed it? Like, did Mookie sign off on that? It I, sure felt like it. I, I mean, the only thing that would have been more clear is if we had a mission accomplished banner falling down. You know, I felt like that. That, that would have been great. I would have popped yeah. for that. I If they've had dynamic rankings this whole time that are changing in real time after results are entered... Um, then I think it's, you know, frankly, not fair that they haven't been publishing them. They should have them as a bug in the screen throughout the entire show. Oh, yeah. I mean, it, Mookie, we, we know that you're an ELO guy. The, the fact that we're not having adaptive rankings after every match, I mean, what are we even doing here? I mean, the fact that we have to say presumptive number one contender, Dr. Britt Baker, DMD, is a little insulting. Like, you, you, you would think that we would show more respect to the presumptive number one contender, but... I thought that, like, this post-match thing, I mean, I think everything Britt has done lately has been tremendous here. And I think Sheeta throwing the kendo stick was just, like, a nice touch there. And, you know, I'm glad that we have w at least one solid direction for Double or Nothing, which, guys, you do know Double or Nothing's in five weeks, and it's $50. I, I discussed this with Oaken in the— uh, It's not it, Double or Nothing, right? It's all out? No, it's Double or Nothing. It's Double or Nothing in May. Double or Nothing in May. All oh, out right. in Vegas, yep. Okay. Not in Vegas, but typically in right. Vegas. Right, Vegas. Jack's show. Vegas. <laughs> got him uh i discussed this with oak gan but here's my question about brit versus sheeta you know brit got the dmd chant uh you know doing this little thing where she didn't do a promo she just got the dmd or not chant you know but they followed along with her the crowd is going to cheer when she wins if, if she wins at double or nothing the crowd is going to cheer for her yeah well yeah the question is do you just run with brit as a baby face then or does she need to get the, the heel heat back? Ogan was saying, yeah, but she does a good job of writing that line and she'll get the fans against her again on Dynamite uh, if necessary. So I, I'm wondering what you guys think about which is the right path to go I, with, with I, Brett. I think I that... I think you just you don't change the character and you let the fans do whatever they want. Yeah, I mean, the Young Bucks for over a decade were heels that fans decided to, to cheer for. Like, it's going to happen. And I mean, new champion pop and only thing you have to do is on a Wednesday, Britt Baker cuts a promo, completely shits on the fans, and, you know, then you don't have to worry about it. I mean, this is, I, I, I don't foresee this being a big problem. I did totally forget about Double or Nothing, and now, so, Sheet is not actually going to get the belt when we're back to touring, right? That's too bad. Unless they do a way. full crowd in Daly's place, because they did do a sellout for a Mission Gun Kelly they show. Just do it but it, it, even then, it won't really be the same if it's just in Daly's place again. Right. I mean, no, no, it, it's, I mean, it, it, it'll be factually correct, but spiritually, no. Sheeta will get another run. I don't think this is the end of Sheeta as champion in this company. Sure. Yeah. All right. We got a, a Miro pre-tape. He's very mad. He wants a championship and he asks, which champion do I beat first? Uh, somebody else brought this up. I can't remember who it was, but it wasn't me. Do Is Miro facing and perhaps beating Darby Allen at double or nothing? 
that's uh would be a good match uh yeah. would be a totally totally credible victor for the title would not feel like a, an unearned title victory i think if he were to do that um and yeah you know that gives a little bit of uh something for darby to do to chase it and try and win it back i suppose and, and it's certainly more interesting than Miro versus Mox, or I'm sorry, Miro versus Kenny. Yeah, <laughs> is, and... it, is, it, is it? It's not super more interesting. Miro versus Kenny is also <laughs> pretty tantalizing. I think. I think that this is more interesting because, like, Miro should be like the perfect guy. Like we talked about Darby having the Darby match. Like Miro should be like the best example about it, unless unless suddenly we're going to see Takeda come over and do a death match with Darby, which would be insanely sick. But. Like, I, I find that more compelling use of Miro than, like, Miro versus Omega, like, it'll probably be great. Like, don't get me wrong here, but I, f- I feel like the idea of, I want to see the kind of twist that Miro makes with the Derby match, and I feel like that's more personally compelling. I guess I just think <laughs> Miro is more likely to beat Darby than sure. Kenny. So I, I'm not really interested in just seeing him go lose to Kenny. I don't, that doesn't excite me. Yeah, well, I think you're right about that. Um, also... Uh, I mean, we. I, I just said they don't do this, but if they gave Miro the belt, maybe they could just have him go kill guys on TV in six minutes every week. Um, that would be great. He kills guys very well. So maybe they'd be more likely to book something like that than they would Darby, who's a small guy. Uh, Tony was with the Inner Circle. Basically, Jericho putting over the Blood and Guts match. Santana had maybe the best promo on the whole show here as part of this segment. He says, we saw the color of your blood, but on May 5th, we're going to see the size of your hearts. He, I think Santana has done the best job of like taking his heel persona and just barely changing it so that now it's it's a babyface persona, uh, but it still just seems like a tough guy. Whereas Jericho, while I defended the first promo, has is now descended into like WWE stuff. Yeah, I mean, it was WWE stuff last week, too, but it, <laughs> it was, I guess, a, a, a bit better realized. It, it It's something where, like, now we've seen the dark and sexy version of the inner circle, and, like, the only people that I feel like have, like, adapted and changed are Santana and Ortiz. Like, like yeah, you're absolutely right. Like, he did, like, like tweak it a little bit, and then, like, Sammy, you know, very close to kind of being, like, that kind of thing, whereas, like, Jericho just looks like, you know... uh divorced dad who wanted to go to Sturgis, which I mean, he did go to Sturgis, but Which he did. Yeah. 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 Uh, next up, Billy Gunn versus QT Marshall QT one with the diamond cutter after Anthony, Agogo uh, gave him a little help with a punch. And after the match, yeah. So go, go gave, gave QT a wooden chair. He went to hit <laughs> Billy, uh, but Dustin made the save. I love the factory so much guys. <laughs> They're just so good. Like, well, like QT in this role is tremendous. And, you know, the governor socking people in the stomach, Mr. Freak Beast, like taking chair shots to the head. And then, you know, Aaron Solo, like, how can't you love this group here? And, you know, this match was completely like what it was. But I mean, it, I had a great time and I was cackling the entire time. Like, it just was, it, it's Billy Gunn in 2021 versus QT Marshall. Like, can we take a step back and recognize like how wild that, like, if you told us five years ago, like, this would be, like, the... Okay, that's not the semi-main event. This would be one of the matches on the number two promotion in America. And a storyline would be QT Marshall versus Billy Gunn at nearly 60. Like, it's just preposterous. This, this is just to, to piss off the New Japan fan club, North America, unofficial chapter. Uh, but second base promotion in the world. You He's know... not wrong. I, I have not done my tier list in a, in a while nate but i would probably say say that aew is probably the only a tier thing to wwe's ass right now so you're absolutely right well, yeah i mean it has the second biggest revenue so makes more revenue from tv than new japan does in total so thoros is typing <laughs> 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 all right the elite uh, are in their trailer with their personal cameraman again doug Callis says there's never been an assembly of talent like this uh, he finally advertises the impact match on pay-per-view this weekend with Rich Swan, uh, and then Matt is doing his thing about you know we're actually the ones who started this. It's called All Elite Wrestling, not All Moxley and Kingston Wrestling. Uh, Kenny kind of notes offhand that he heard that they're back tonight. Uh, we hear a car honking outside, and they do a whole bit about you know can we stop this? So actually, this is like a live promo, so you got to just do your thing. 
And then we see Box and Kingston drive their truck into the trailer. They go inside, but no one is there. Very confusing to me uh, because we just heard them outside. So where did they go? We, we, we heard them outside. They established that it was live. That was confirmed by the truck, which was out there honking. They didn't have any reason to exit the trailer because they didn't know that he was out there going to run into them with a truck. Pretty confusing. Yeah, very confused. I mean, this was like a Shaq level uh, disappearance. <laughs> Ooh, maybe maybe Shaq uh, spirited them away. Ooh, using his mysterious vehicle disappearance powers. Perhaps, but this does feel like speaking of double or nothing. That hopefully we're going to get Young Bucks versus uh, Moxley and Kingston, which feels like a fun use of of everyone there. Yeah, Moxley and Kingston had great interplay here. They're just really fun to to watch together it's like they they advertise moxley and kingston are back it's a oh they missed one week and now they're making their giant return but you do actually go oh god i I like seeing those guys together they're they're kind of fun then we had powerhouse hobbs versus christian cage and uh, christian won with the kill switch we discussed that one we had a jade cargo pre-tape she says every manager in AEW is looking to sign her but she doesn't need a manager but if they want to sign her they're gonna have to make her a hell of an offer so not sure if Jade's getting a manager or not. I'm just trying to think of the Miss Elizabeth thing of everyone managing Jake Cargill for one match. I know, Aaron, you were talking about this earlier, but I just have like the idea of Jake the Snake Roberts like, coming out to like Jade's entrance with like the lasers coming down, and it just makes me very happy just to think about. So it has to happen. They should have all of the Jeopardy tryout hosts get one week managing Jade Cargill after they do Jeopardy. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Oz has entered Daly's place. Oh, no. Uh, I mean, I think this is a good time to bring back the Hikaru Shida dating game, but we just turn it into the Jade Cargill managing game for the real old E uh, potheads. I don't, can't remember how long ago we talked about the Hikaru Shida dating game. <laughs> Less than a year. Less than okay, a year. Not that long ago. All right, good. Uh, and then the main event was the TNT title match with Darby Allen defeating Jungle Boy with the Last Supper. But after the match, folks, the fun was not over because Scorpio Sky and Ethan Page attacked Darby and Jungle Boy. Lance Archer made the save. As someone pointed out in a DM, they brought Ethan on last so that he couldn't tank the rating. <laughs> I, I, is Lance Archer going to explain what it, he's doing? Uh, his whole uh, thing was that he agreed with Scorpio Sky and Ethan Page, but then Sting was like, "Actually, I agree with you too." And now, <laughs> now that so they're all in agreement. Agreement. <laughs> they're all in agreement. <laughs> but Lance and Sting are on one side of the equation, and Scorpio Sky and all ego Ethan Page are on the other side, for some reason. Um, yeah, this was this was like. You know, that I didn't even rate this a delete is like, you know, the most damning indictment. I was like, no, it's not even anything. This segment may as well have not happened. But we didn't even mention that uh, Sting and Luchasaurus very gingerly brawled to the back during this match. Yeah, I, I like the fact that there was like a moment where, where like there was like that reverse Yoshi tonic, like that just never really looks that great. But everyone's like, oh, they're winded. And then suddenly... Uh, Lucha, so or sorry, Jungle Boy does three topes in a topes in a row, and then then they have the the brawl to the back. Like this is when they're trying to catch their ba- catch their breath is when Sting and Luchasaurus are basically aggressively hugging on their way to the back. The only thing I can figure out is you know uh, Archer is a Trump guy, uh, so Trump famously just went with whatever the last person said to him. So Sting was the last person to say that he agreed with Lance. So that's just what stuck in his mind. I don't uh, I don't mind that as a long-term storyline for Lance Archer where he's just constantly flipping from one side to the other because people are able to get in his ear. And... Uh Jake Roberts like making sure he's standing like at the at the doorway just so after everyone everyone leaves and he's like no this is what we're doing actually Lance like yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that works actually. Okay, well, that was Dynamite for this week. Uh, if you if you like our show and you want to support it, the best way to do so is to head over to patreon.com slash everything elite and subscribe. Uh, we have three tiers, lots of content. This week, our, our major piece of content uh, was uh, the Mixtape Club returning with me and Murder Brian, one of uh, my favorite guests to have on any podcast. And we talked about Christian Metalcore, which is funny because 
Brian doesn't like metalcore, and he's uh, famously non-Christian. So that was a good time. Uh, we also did light, like we always do. Mike and I preview Dynamite, talk about dark and elevation. Nate gives us the vlog quick hits. Uh, speaking of the last part of, of Dynamite, Nate, I understand uh, you have a special episode planned for next week. Yeah. <laughs> Upcoming uh, for Monday, I think. Uh, this is Ethan Page. It's the, right. the, the grand return of uh, the heralded Patreon series. This is where we do in-depth looks at uh, a guy's career who's in this promotion. So Ethan Page will be, will be climbing that mountain. All right. And, Congrats. And joining me for that as only appropriate for an Ethan Page vlog deep dive. Uh, Kevin and Chris from the Bad Wrestling Podcast. What's funny is I was thinking about my next episode of Big Step Club and I had planned basically since I came up with the idea to ask Chris to do this next episode with me. And so at the end of the day, I was like, I know you just recently have agreed to do a show with me on our <laughs> Patreon, but now I'm going to ask you again to do another show. So I, I, I mean, he's that'll take that, me months to put together, I'm sure. He's getting the EE challenge coin really quickly, you know. Yes, he is. Uh, lots of other good stuff. Uh, we got a great Discord. Join us there. If you join the $8 tier, uh, you can uh, listen to the show live and get the replay up until, well, I mean, forever, but, you know, until it goes up on the free feed. So do that. Uh, it's patreon.com slash everything elite. Next week on Dynamite, we have Penta versus Orange Cassidy, Chris Statlander versus Penelope Ford. Penelope back. Uh, tag title with, eliminator with, with Kip Sabian. There was uh, a lot. Yeah. Uh, Miro made a big deal about Kip not being around, and they just announced, "Hey, uh, Kip's back now," and didn't make any sort of note. Now he's like, "Yeah, he's on the show. Uh, <laughs> whatever." Yeah, so I'm hoping that Miro doesn't like somehow get in. Oh, he's going to, isn't he? Miro's somehow going to get involved, and he oh and for sure Trent yeah. are going to brawl or something. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I mean, they can't go right back to that. They, they, they obviously they're making a big departure from that for Miro. So, it, he's got to move on to somebody else. I, I hope. I so. mean, I'll believe it when I see it. You know, it, it seems like something. So, Aaron, you're about to get into this, and I had to look something up here, so I didn't mean to interrupt here. But they're having this tag title eliminator that's coming up: Young Bucks versus the Sidels. They don't want to call it a non-title match; they call it a, a title eliminator. Uh. Take a guess where the Seidel brothers are ranked, Nate. Second. All right, Aaron, take a guess. I'll say fourth, the Yuka Sakazaki memorial spot. Well, that was third, and no, <laughs> they aren't third. They are not ranked in the most recent oh. ones. So this is a title eliminator for a team that's outside the top five rankings. That's, that's that sounds right. Yeah, That sounds right. Um uh, no, that's, kind of, that's kind of fine, because if you beat the champion, you should get a title shot. So really, any non-title match against the champion is a title eliminator. I'm okay with that. I'm going to uh, they like the question. term. They really like the term eliminator. Like, that's their favorite thing. Instead of championship opportunity, it is eliminators in this company. Nate, I'm going to put this question to you. This is a good part of our, our YouTube chat. Mm -hmm. uh, patron Goshpunk asks, why? I said, why what? They said, why is this Ethan Page? <laughs> because he's there <laughs> all right that's compelling people are going to subscribe now sure. um, i'm i'm monetizing the rot of my hatred for ethan page is what i'm doing <laughs> i like that uh we're gonna have a trios match with uh nightmare family versus the factory uh the inner circle and pinnacle parlay will apparently occur and brian cage versus hangman page we're getting through those those page versus cage matches. This is the first one. Eventually, we'll get all yep. combinations of cage versus page will happen in this promotion. We'll, we'll, what date do you have for this, guys, in the pool? I have um, October 1. October 1. The one-year anniversary is when they will pull out the... October 2 for me. Okay. <laughs> well, I didn't know we were doing prices right rules here, but I didn't make the yeah. rules very defined, but that's fair. Yeah. That's fair. All right. Well, that'll be on Dynamite next week. We'll be here to talk about it. Uh, until then, make sure you're uh, following us on Twitter at Everything AEW. I'm at Aaron Like the Car. Nate's at Epinesis. Mike's at Fuji Heya. Subscribe to the podcast. Give us a five star rating and review on the Apple Podcast app. Uh, make sure you use This Is over at Manscaped. You use Elite at My Bookie. And you subscribe to patreon.com slash Everything Elite. So for Mike, for Nate, I'm Aaron. We'll see you next time. Nothing.